Hi everyone. Good day, everyone. So welcome to the section on US solutions for an impact led recovery. And uh, this is Bonnie and I'm from Hong Kong and uh, we're from Social Enterprise Research Academy. And it's my pleasure to be the moderator of today's panel with you all on the topic of US solutions for impact led recovery with three great speakers with us today. As we all know that, you know, COVID 19 has bring a huge impact on US economy and the disruption in geopolitical and trade and economic environmental technology and consumer preferences. So this disruption is increasing the urgency to transform because we cannot go back to the old normal. So the landscape has totally been changed and I'm sure the major question for most CEOs is how can I put back my company on track to growth and what is the new strategy that one could reframe the future of organization? To tackle this question, we must reimagine an impact-led growth strategy for long-term value creation. Why is it? Let's look at the trend created by several transformative forces. First is the geopolitical landscape. There is a rapid changing geopolitical trade and regulatory landscape. And we can see that many governments moving from a interventionist policy position. Also, there's an increased focus on the climate emergency and environmental impact of businesses. Many institutional investors have changed their portfolio inclusion criteria based on the environmental risk as well. And this shows that SS under management with a focus on ESG impact has climbed up from US dollar 22.8 trillion in 2016 to today, 2000, by 2021 is US dollar 37.8 trillion already. And we're forecasting it to go up to even US dollar 53 trillion by 2025. So when we look at the consumer side, a growing consumer trust deficit has also serviced, driven by rising customer expectations around business transparency, and sustainability as well. So on the other hand, companies are facing increasing competition to attract and to retain skilled workforce, especially when employees campaigning on issues such as health, safety, diversity, and inclusiveness are also intensifying. So we must not forget the technology part as well. There's continuous technological disruption and convergence as well which cuts across industry. And I think technology is getting more important in the post-19 COVID world. After review, reviewing the why, I think here comes the how. So how can business integrate their impact-led growth strategy? When we talk about an impact-led growth strategy <clears throat> for business, I think five industry-wide themes emerge as critical elements. Research pointed out that the focusing on five themes, which are trust, trade, technology, and sustainability, as well as people at the, at the center of all aspects of business are getting very important, especially when companies are reimagining their strategy for recovery. So today's panel, we are very happy to have our speakers, one from Australia and two from US to share with us more on thoughts and your cases, real cases, on how your business or how you see business could actually drive an impact like growth strategy based on the mentioned five themes. And first of all, I would like to invite Nick Soas to speak before us. And Nick, could you please introduce maybe your topic and yourself briefly, and then we will follow up with questions. Sure, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Nick Ebling, founder and CEO of Not Impossible Labs, which is a social tech incubator that was designed about 10 years ago. We're a decade old now, and we focus on what we call the creation of technology for the sake of humanity. And what that means, we look at real social issues in the world, and then we convene disparate, brilliant members of, of, of our kind of talent pool, which 
is everything. We call them our misfit geniuses and mad scientists. We convene them and we'll absolutely jump on whatever that is that particular issue, that social issue is. And then we'll try to create prototypical solutions. Typically, it is either hardware or software that comes out of it. And then we figure out how to scale that. Um, the distinction, I think, not impossible versus other incubators is that typically incubators are looking for returns and their returns are measured by is this a, you know, the common question, is it a 10x company? Is it a, is it a unicorn? It's always based on the financial outputs with the way that we work at Non Impossible. Our impact is always measured based on how, or the, how we measure what we're going to tackle is based on the impact. So once the impact is measured, then we decide is the best way to scale the solution to go through a nonprofit? Is it to give it away open source? Or is it to spin it off as its own separate for-profit venture? So we've done this for about a decade now. Uh, the project that we're working on right now, probably most passionate about is, and we'll talk a little bit about this today, is this project called Bento. And Bento, we'll go into greater detail in a bit, but it really hinges on looking at how to create recovery within a very specific sector of the market and then use different parts of our economy and supply chain to contribute back into that solution. That's great, yes. And um, I think that um, as you're in US, can you also tell us more like the current situation of US economy? And so that we can learn more about that. And um, especially when you talk about like so many, maybe Unicorn has been um, doing different things. So maybe you can further share with us and your thoughts on the how how you how you see that people is all important in the center of everything in the COVID world as well? Was that directed towards me? Yes, yes, my yes. yes. Sure. I mean, for us, when you're looking at how to create solutions, our we have a very specific design process at Non Impossible. Uh, it, the core to it is what we call frictionless innovation, frictionless design, and the. I guess the point of differentiation for that is many times when you're looking at how to create a novel or unique invention or innovation, you're looking at the outcome. We measure against that outcome of impact that I mentioned before, but we also look at how to create the least amount of behavior changes for mm -hmm. you to actually be able to have a benefit of whatever it is, the solution we've created. So that's a real key point of distinction, because I think that as we become, as we have evolved into being such a technological beings, we have become fast, we've become impatient, we've become, um, we, we require efficiency in terms of how we interact and what we do. And if there is too much of a behavior change, then you have a lot of slippage and leakage out of whatever that potential solution is going to be. So what we attack when we're looking at our human centered approach is how do you create the most amount of impact, the most amount of results with the least amount of behavior change? That's a very great point. So these amounts of behavioral change is so important. And uh, let me maybe also briefly introduce Nikas, um, because I understand that you're one, the only person that have ever been honored two times as in Time Magazine top invention. Top invention on the... Um, um, on the year recipient, and you also have a mission of creating the world or changing the world through creating technology for the sake of humanity. So, apart from Bento, in your previous projects, um, you have also been focusing on also to achieving this mission, right? Can you also uh, let us know more about like your previous uh, various kind of projects on different themes and how um, how you actually try to create change without too much change on behavioral change, behavioral behavior, yeah. Um, we've had a, a whole mix of different projects from creating ocular recognition devices made of cheap sunglasses from the Venice Beach boardwalk, coat hangers, duct tape, zip ties, and a web camera. And then we wrote, we wrote some code that allowed a paralyzed artist to draw again using only their eyes. Um, I went into South Sudan, into refugee camp there, um, and we deployed the world's first 3D printing prosthetic lab. Again, rather than having the, the process of having for someone who is a child of war or someone who has suffered an amputation, 
someone in a refugee camp who's completely isolated from uh, a lot of the medical and uh, physiological needs that someone has to be fitted for a prosthetic, we figured out how to take it there and actually bring the solution to someone. And that's that's a reoccurring theme in a lot of the things we do. Rather than, we always talk about, rather than people having to make a pilgrimage to Mecca, instead bring mm -hmm. Mecca to the people, right? And so it's always about the solutions being accessible, easy, uh, frugal innovation is another kind of undercurrent to a lot of the things that we do. This is very amazing. Um, so I understand that you would like to share with us you know, your projects and how you're going to like uh, conduct a uh, bento this project to enable business to learn more about like the importance of people centric strategy. So can you share more with us on your project on bento? Because I think it's a very good case to like especially on on solving the issue of hunger, people. Sure. So um, at the onset of the pandemic, April, May, March, April of 2020, at least we marked that as the onset because it's when schools started to close here in the States and in, and in Los Angeles where I live. So we kind of use that as a, as a milestone, as an, as an indices of when we really started to feel it. Um, we witnessed kids especially kids that came from, from poor communities, at-risk communities, losing their free and reduced meals. We also noticed restaurants then having to close or not having business to be the business to keep their doors open. So that combined with this obsession we had had for the couple of years prior of looking at this concept in the States called food insecurity, which is not starvation. Food insecurity is out of 21 meals a week, maybe you only have 15, 16 meals. So you have enough to stay alive, but there's still a big gap in terms of your ability to stay healthy and to not be constantly worried and stressed about where your next meal is going to come from, especially if you're, you know, a parent and you've got, you know, bear cubs you're taking care of. So what we ended up doing is through a lot of conversations with people, um, you know, the, the market, there's 50 million people in this country who are food insecure. We had a lot of conversations with different different cohorts and different groups. And in the end, we came up with a conclusion that the best way to deliver a solution was to actually start to subvert the traditional supply chain of how people who are food insecure were fed, which is typically pushing people to free sources of food, which when you talk about that, you're talking about nodes on a map where you're making people make pilgrimages to a food mm -hmm. bank or a soup kitchen. And so what we did is we overlaid the greatest source of food in at least in our town and our in our country um, which are restaurants and grocery stores and so we created an overlay on that and created a means by which organizations who already manage the cohorts of people that they had so there's large clusters of you know the boys and girls club or the veterans administration or so there's already these clusters of, of people who people know the organizations know they're food insecure through simple text messaging they were able to walk into a restaurant and claim a meal without having to take a bus or walk or bike or, you know, borrow a car to get all the way across town. They were just able to walk into a local restaurant and claim a meal in their name with pure dignity. So what happened is the, the benefactors on this, so the person obviously was able to claim a meal and claim a healthy meal. The organization was able to feed them and, and take care of those people in a world, especially in the kind of the height of the pandemic. You didn't want to bring a bunch of people together because we didn't know if that was going to be a super spreader event or what was going to happen. So now you distributed the supply chain to have different points around the map being restaurants. But the thing that I think that we love the most is that by going through text messaging, we had no adoption of apps or no, no new adoption of behaviors back to the friction of technology. The thing that we love most is that when you walked in, you walked in as my name is Mick or my name is Michael or my name is George, and I just walk in and claim a meal just like anybody else. And I wasn't identified as someone who's food insecure. So we were always able to maintain that sense of dignity. So we're really excited about what's happening with this because when you look at, and we can talk more about this in a second, when you look at the key factor of how we were able to create this, there was a convening of a social need, but a business execution, as opposed to deploying resources through public executions and public you know, means of large nonprofits or government organizations, which notoriously aren't the most efficient, we were now able to convene it so the private sector benefited. That's very great, yes. 
I'm really and truly inspired by your project and how you actually <clears throat> align a network of corporates to actually supply the future to these people and, and also to retain the importance of dignity on the people. This side is very important. I think that because, you know, um, I think um, people that wants to claim the food also wants to um, not only be, be ashamed to claim the food as well, but also you know, to to be respected as well. So um, uh, thank you, Mike, for your sharing. And I, I, I think that Bento, this, um, this project is really a good example to illustrate what is people-centered strategy, as well as, as you said, to incorporate government as well as to incorporate corporate private sector as well. So um, I think that uh, this will help the, us to have much more reference on how can we uh, figure out a impact growth strategy for business. Another another speaker I would like to introduce is um, is a uh, is a person that is now in Australia, right? And uh, maybe uh, you can tell us more about your background, um, uh, Mr. Nicholas Johnson. I know that you are very experienced in technology, and you have been a co-author of a book called "The Economics of the Fourth Industrial Revolution," which is on the internet artificial intelligence, blockchain as well. And I, I know that you have also been known for running, very good at running corporate training workshop as well on this um, technology side. Maybe you can let us know more about you and what you think about today's topic on an impact like growth strategy. Thank you. Sure, thank you very much. Um, so I've got a background uh, as an economist um, and a mathematician. Um, but I've got a real passion for solving applied problems um, using some of these these lenses, the, the technical lens and, and the economics lens. Um, and I, th I see technology as um, a tool and an avenue for solving some of these um, current issues that we're seeing in the world. And I think they can actually help us to move from where we are, where we are currently to um, a better place um, with more sustainable growth, um, rethinking how, how profit, um, is, is created. Um, and that is a messy process. Um, that's just the reality of it. So I think, um, if businesses are going to adopt some of these new technologies to redesign how they create value in, in the economy and in society, they need to, first of all, bring people along on the journey and that requires building trust. Um, so there's two points I want to make on the issue of trust. And um, first of all, businesses need to be upfront and transparent about what they're actually doing. Um, that actually builds trust with consumers and the broader stakeholders. Um, so to give one example, um, just this week, I visited um, one of the sites of a last mile drone delivery company in, in Australia. Um, and when they first launched in the community, they faced a bit of backlash because people didn't understand and they were scared of these drones flying around and they were scared about the noise. Um, and what they actually did, um, you know, they were dragging from the Senate, all that sort of stuff. What they actually did to build trust with, with the community was go out and before launching, any new drones in a new area, they would stand in the shopping malls and they would chat to people and hold the drones up and actually be upfront and transparent and answer all the questions. And I think um, once they did that, they were able to progress the adoption of the, the new technology in the community much more easily. Um, second example. So companies like, like Facebook and other big conglomerates have come under fire for um, a lack of transparency and breaches of, see breaches of trust around the handling of data. And I think that if some of these big companies with, you know, really transformative technology make their further effort to be more transparent and upfront about what they're doing and then take people along on that journey, then people will be, will be less surprised and less fearful of, of, of what it is. So um, that's, that's two things, two, two examples I want to give on, on trust. Um, it's impossible to adopt new technology without bringing people along in the journey and that requires building that trust. That's right. Um, 
and I also understand that um, you you are you are very experienced in in the technology of AI and data science. Do you think? Can you share with us on how what you think like I can actually use this technology to help business to 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 recover from COVID nineteen impact? Uh, can you also share with us on like um, your 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 country on in Australia? What's the current situation, and how what's the impact that COVID brings to your economy as well? Sure. So th this is the book that um, might have been referenced earlier. So um, I think uh, AI and and blockchain, uh, but particularly AI in this instance. Um, can help businesses to redesign their labor force. Um, and I think that's inevitable. Um, but I think when you, to, to do this successfully, what I've observed is we need to make a clear distinction between jobs and, and um, the people who do those jobs and the actual tasks those jobs require. So instead of seeing jobs and the people who do those jobs as a fixed entity, um, whereby if those tasks are no longer needed, you just let go of the people. I think there needs to be a broader focus on reskilling and retraining um, so that those people can move around and, and, and do different tasks as those job, job descriptions evolve. Um, so I'd say that, yes, AI is, is good. It's not going to replace people. Um, I think it has a lot of um, benefits in terms of better use of data um, and I would probably have some um, quite frank questions around some of the COVID-19 um, policy responses. I believe that they have not always been data-driven. And so I think if we want to use AI appropriately, we need to make sure that we have accurate data so that we can actually have data-informed policy. So what is the current situation of your, your Australia under the, the impact of COVID? Is it yeah, so, well, yeah, for most of the pandemic so far, Australia has been pretty lucky. Um, we avoided most of the breakouts in 2020 um, and in 2021. Um, it was really only the, the Omicron breakout that um, uh, that caught hold in Australia and has um, let rip over the last few months. Um, and as that has happened, a lot of the state governments um, have just throwing their hands up in the air and said, look, you know, all of our lockdowns, um, all of our restrictions that we had in place, um, they're no longer relevant because it's in the community and it's spreading. And so actually now that it's out in the community, um, we have returned to almost COVID, you know, pre-COVID normal life in terms of the restrictions that we have in place and people are just learning to live with it. Mm. But do you think that during this COVID time, it actually enabled the users or the people that have more trust on technology or as you mentioned now? Um, I think it's certainly in Australia, um, the event, the, the, the Black Swan event of COVID-19 definitely sped up the adoption of new technology and it forced people to adapt and to, and to learn new skills. Um, many people lost their jobs. They had to reskill to take up new jobs. They had to adapt to working remotely. And I'm sure though you know, these observances will be mirrored in the United States as well. Mm. But do you think that, um, so business have to use this technology as speed so as to recover their, their growth. And during that, during this time, as you mentioned, they, we, need, we need trust. People need to trust the technology so as to, to, to join in the force and to get adapted to the technology, the new technology. But do you think what, can you also share with us what kind of transformative mindset that is actually needed for, for across the entire organization so as to realize the value of technology and to improve human experience actually in this changing from physical to virtual world? Because as you know, nowadays, there's a lot of like, like Meta, they were we got a lot of new technology upcoming, NFT, etc. So how can we actually, as maybe as business, we can manage to manage this change, and to have our company to join in to manage this change, adapt to it, 
and also to practice it. And during that process, there will be risk. And how can we manage the risk? Can you share with us more on that, please? Yes, I'll just keep my comments short. Um, so, uh, yeah, you get a chance to speak as well. Um, just reflecting what I said previously, I think that you know, technology is great, but at the end of the and at the end of the day, it comes down to people. You need to bring people along in the journey. Um, businesses exist and survive because they create value for people, um, and that value needs to be perceived by people. Um, otherwise, the transaction is not going to take place. So. Uh, we can't get so caught up in technology that we, we miss people. Okay, uh, well understood. So, um, those were we still have time. So, um, Yen, thank you for sharing. Uh, I know that you're in San Francisco, right? Yes. Yes, um, I understand you are very focused on biotech and you're a CEO and co-founder of BioCaptivate, a think tank to shape the culture as well as to enhance the networking in your biotechnology field. And as we as we spoken before, I understand that you will share with us more on how you think the rise of biotech and deep tech can actually help with this um, recovery of the economy and how you think it is very important to um, for for we to look into biotech and deep tech, especially in the COVID world. Can you show with us, please? Thank you. Sure. So um, BioCaptive is a think tank that focus on the people side of science, because I believe that science is about scientists and that's about people. And it does not matter how great the technology is. Like if you ignore the people side of matter, then things just will not work. So let's jump straight to today's topic. So I believe that crisis does not really create new opportunity as much as it, am it amplify what already exists and also it changes the balance and the, keeps the balance of the, the composition of the uh, things that already exist. So through COVID, we see the rise of biotech and those. And if you look into the details of the technology, we see that some previous dismissed technology such as the mRNA, mRNA technology and those become really important and salient. So the thing is that um, right now we see that the continuous rise of biotech and it pertain to many pressing problems in the world such as that um, right now a lot of talks about petroleums but the thing is that you can actually use microbes using fermentation technology and those to make a lot of um, chemicals and compounds that previously have to rely on, uh, on petroleum that's uh, heavy uh, uh, polluting. So therefore that like, th there are so many examples of like deep tech and life science and biotech that can be used to illustrate that how technology can be used to make people's life better. And we see that um, right now that the, there's an emphasis on a lot of technology that are personally matter, like such as like the investing in psychedelics and in mental health, in longevity, and also the focus, renew focus on the uh, epigenomic uh, type of uh, biotech side of things. Then we, we see that like th this type of things really like is a, re it shows a re alignment of like the, about the fact that technology should be there to serve people. Yes, I, I, I also understand that you, like investors previously may concern about like the quick returns from the investment, but in biotech it requires much more long-term investment. But from your experience, do you think that, um, can you, maybe you can advise us what, why you think investors should look into biotech more and, be, and beyond, is it only from, academic experts and why is industry experts so important when business try to tap into the biotech field as well? Yeah, I think anytime you enter a new field, it's very important to check the assumptions and the uh, fixed value. Because I think a lot of time investors, they have one particular playbook and user they uh, like some, not everyone of course, but some people they uh, tend to like only focus on pay attention to things that can be put into an Excel spreadsheet. But the reality is that a lot of things, they just just uh, don't fit in the a spreadsheet or can they're not numbers. And so that, um, it's very important for investors to kind of um, pay attention to 
whose advisors are you taking and who are your advisors and a lot of time like if you like people tend to stick to people who they know or people tend to stick to things that they are familiar with but the thing is that like if if you do that you you, you can put yourself in a very uh, biased situation like a confirmation bubble so i think like and and right now with a doubt that deep ten life science are important because they change people's life and i think investors need to realize that they um they need to have um different sets of people different sets of advisors and and you certainly like why people have a business background they want to go into life science they they tend to uh, look into academia or tend to ask some famous professors about their opinion but the thing is academia is it's great for a lot of things, but you have a very different selective pressure. So like you get what you measure. So if like academia rewards people who are very good in publishing papers or, or there are a lot of people who excel in a very bureaucratic environment, then those type of talent are not exactly the type of talent that allow you to excel in business or in like deep tech, because deep tech is about manifesting some something into the real world. And that take different type of talent and you will find those type of people have that type of talent from industrial experts because people in industrial they have they, they have just done the work and they, so they are pragmatic they are practical they are not just about publishing papers or theory and so there's a very good combination and also like a lot of time if you are in industrial you get a chance to really uh, interact with different sectors of society and so so therefore that it it just create um, it, uh, uh, the, the correct the right environment to shape the type of people that are good at like making pragmatic real world impact. Can you also share with us more on your projects that is that you think um, that can make any real impact to the world as well? So we, sure. so we host um, events and we bring people together and but right now like because of COVID that we are not doing any like in person events but the thing is that one thing I, I have learned is that like like most people they have uh, underestimate the power of bringing the right people together with the right question or right problem because like sometimes people a lot of times people just interact with each other and have small talks and uh exchange business card but that's actually very wasteful so so you actually you need a third party to kind of give them permission about talking about something that they actually want to talk about like and because context is very powerful so we provide this context and we provide this from like sometimes we just know that there are two person who should definitely collaborate but there's no chance that they will meet if, if without third party introduction so you bring them together and then you provide a very succinct reason and then a lot of amazing things can happen so that's one of the things that we are focusing on. Mm. Is is it um is it also sim um because uh when I review uh, make your profile, um I think is it also similar because what you do you also have a team of hackers, doers and makers and thinkers. You bring people all together to to create devices to bring a better world. Um, do you, how how do you, can you also share with us that they make how you actually able to bring these different people this into a team to to the, because it's very people thing you know so how how do you do that source people how source talent well I think I we I share Jan's uh, a kind of feeling about the convening of people because you get the you know it's it's not a very um, far thing for someone to understand, but the more minds you convene together, if with the right kind of constraints or guidelines, you can see some magic take place. So as I said earlier, we convene these teams of mad scientists and misfit geniuses together to talk about a particular idea. The, the I guess one of the distinctions in our design thinking is that we have a, a philosophy called help one, help many. If we convene people together, and we bring in a group of experts, makers, programmers, architects, designers, you know, fill in the blank, just different people from different walks of life. And I say, let's solve hunger. Hunger is this massive issue. And we could work all day, we could work all week, we could work all month, we could work all year on something. And when things get tough, 
it's easy to walk away from the concept of hunger. It's the concept of hunger is something that a human has the ability to disassociate unless they experienced it, right? So when that's the many, that's starting with the many. But what we do is we start with one. We always choose one person. And that one person represents the humanity of the solution that we want to try and solve. So that when I say, let's solve this, this let's solve hunger for Jimmy, let's solve hunger for you know, Jane, whoever it might be, when things get tough and they will get tough, then you're able to see the face of the person because we end up putting, you know, we keep that in, we post that on our walls, we post that in all of our emails, is that there's a way for you to see the human being on the other side. And that humanity is what drives us forward when, when things get tough. And that's a really important component of how we come up with the solutions we do. That's, that's very great. Yes. Really learn a lot from that. Yes, people usually would when we talk about one big topic, we would usually drift away to to other part during the course. So this is very important, and I think um, both of you uh, also mentioned that like how we bring people together to the to on the right topic is very important, and in especially when we are trying to do with some social issues, and so uh, we still have. Maybe a few minutes. Like, may I ask if any attendees, such as Michael and George, would you like to ask any questions based on what the speakers have proposed, especially on this topic? You can actually, yeah, okay, you can grab the mic. Just a moment. <laughs> okay, George, oh, grab the mic. I think. Off, 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 you know, I, I think your uh, this topic of a. Uh, Impact led recovery is so deep, you know. <laughs> it's very hard to not like a superficial question. Everybody can comment. This is a very important, but it's so it's such a deep subject. You know, I am doing the uh, I'm managing the company doing the uh, um, manufacturing supply chain. There's so many problems right now, like the chip shortage. Right, they've been two years. Still, most of the electronics product all stopped because of the chips. Till today, still the same problem. That's impact pretty much all the stores, you know, even the cars, you know. So that's a problem. Logistics, right? The shipping, you know, the uh, the port. Till today, nothing mm -hmm. really got done. Still all the problem. You talk about recovery, right? And then let along all the uh, raw material, you know, there's so many things that's really made their their major impact and that's hold down the economy. And these are kind of like a, if you think of that, when the port has a congestion, right? It takes like two, three months and then the shipping cost goes up to max, right? Until today, still the same thing. Been like two years now. So, anyway, are you going to build more ships, or more containers, or more fibers? Whatever those guys are doing, they're yeah. So, so I'm just suffering from all these uh, <laughs> impact from the COVID, and then the solution. I don't know. I think those guys are deliberately doing that because they make a lot of money for that. <laughs> like the logistic guy. But on the grassroots level for ordinary people, you know, without a big capital, what can we do to help the people that got suffered from that with innovation? I think that's a, that's a big, big topic. You know, yes. it's dragging along most people don't really know what to do. Of course, the government can send some checks, you know, so that's the best they can do. But in the day-to-day -day life, need there's a call for a, a lot of uh, need. Yeah, from the food to the you to the day-to-day -day, uh, solutions for whatever problems. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. Yeah. And so, and yeah, especially 
especially for your industry. Where are you from, uh, yeah, uh, George? I mean, from where I was born, or, or I'm right now. I'm in Portland, right now. Oregon. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I'm in. Uh, I'm on the west coast, Portland, Oregon. I see. So I can see that, and uh, in fact, uh, I, I I think that's uh, business under the COVID impact. But I, I'm sure uh, a lot of even like poor so poor people, uh, <clears throat> like the people in hunger, as as Nick you just mentioned, those who have no food. Uh, are actually even worse. I can I can imagine. Yeah, a lot of unemployment must be like happening in Hong Kong. We're actually going to shut down maybe like all the business in the coming weeks, and, and the government is going to plan for that because the Omicron is too strong that we cannot go out, and nearly every everywhere have 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 infections. So. Uh -huh. So you're in, sure. you're in Hong Kong right now. Yeah, I'm in Hong Kong right now. So, yeah, very strong. So I'm I'm sure technology would actually be very important to play into uh, this part, or else we cannot operate. Without technology, we cannot even operate. But again, I think trust issue is also very very important in when as as Nicholas just mentioned, because. How can actually business tra uh, tr track people are actually working and doing the parts, and all whether the operation is actually working well? So this will also be a challenge for all business operator. What about Michael? Uh, do you have any questions? As as I can see, you are attending the. Um, I can see Michael's actually put a question in the group chat. Oh really? Let me. Check. Michael has been asking, taking from your personal experience, if there was one that could advance prototyping to reason problems with supply chain, what do you think it could be? Any speakers would like to take this question? Can you repeat? I can't see the question. Uh, can you repeat the question? Um, from your personal experience. Oh, never there... mind. I, I, I just couldn't see it. Great. If there was one that could advance prototyping to leasing problems with supply chain, what do you think it could be on supply yeah. chain issues? Yeah, the best way to the best way to lessen issues of supply chain is to, um, I mean, this is a this is a general statement is to lessen your dependency on the chain. Right, the fewer link, links you have in a chain the fewer points of failure or leakage you have in a system. So what you're seeing is a lot of just-in-time manufacturing. You're seeing a lot of um, entities that are, are becoming made in fill-in-the-blank, whatever the country is that needs to that. So I think there is an overhauling that, you know, we will always have a global dependence on different resources in different parts of the world, but the more we can become independent within our own economies, then we are able to, to lessen that dependency. Um, I truly believe that, you know, George was talking a little bit about the chip shortage that's taking place right now. You're, you're going to start to see what happens when you don't have a choice but to innovate around the lack of a material or a supply. So I think you're going to see some consumer behavior changes. I think you're going to see some manufacturing behavior changes. I think you're going to see some marketing, some fantastic marketing, just try to talk us out of the things that, that we used to think were important. You know, heated seats and G and cars in the East Coast were incredibly important because it's cold there. They don't have the chips for that. That got cut, so now you don't have heated seats. That's not that's gonna be a topic that that's like a tiny little example, but you're gonna see behavior changes both on the manufacturing and consumer side. Any other speaker would like to also respond to this question? We have one minute left. If not, then uh or like to wrap up today's discussion and I would like to thank you all for your ideas and also contributions as well as um, audiences such as Michael and George. I, I wish you all uh, recover well and from the from the loss in the COVID and um, see you all again in Horasis. Really appreciate Horasis for running this this panels, really helping the society and business to grow. 
especially to sustain during this time, even if it's online. Yes. Thank you so much and have a good day, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank Thanks. Bye. Bye.